Matthew chapter 18 Qualities and Attitudes of Kingdom Citizens Verse 1 At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So the disciples were often concerned about the question of greatness. They seem to ask this question thinking that Jesus has already chosen one of them as the greatest, or as if they wanted Jesus to decide among them. And we can imagine the disciples arguing amongst themselves about which one was the greatest, as they did in Luke chapter 9, and then saying, let's just let Jesus settle this. And so the disciples wanted to know who's going to hold the highest position in the administration Jesus was going to establish. Verse 2 through 4, Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus might have answered the question, who is the greatest, by pointing to himself. Instead, he drew their attention to his nature by having them look at a child as an example. The fact that the child came when Jesus called says something about Jesus. He's the sort of man that children would come to willingly. It also tells us something about Peter. If Peter was to be regarded as the first pope in the way popes are regarded by the Roman Catholic theology and history, Jesus should have declared that Peter was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> so, this was probably a great disappointment to the disciples. They knew that in the day, children were regarded more as property than as individuals. It was understood that they were to be seen and not heard. And Jesus said that we have to take this kind of humble place to enter the kingdom much less be the greatest in the kingdom. right? And a, ch a child was a person of no importance in the Jewish society, subject to the authority of his elders, not taken seriously except as a responsibility, one to be looked after, not one to be looked up to. And children are not threatening. We're not afraid of meeting a five-year-old in a dark alley. Children are not good at deceiving. They're pretty miserable failures at fooling their parents. And the child is held up as an ideal, not an innocence, purity, or faith, but of humility and unconcern for social status. So Jesus then addressed the issue of greatness. When we most fulfill the humble place a child had in that culture, we are then on our own way to greatness in his kingdom. Humbles himself does not refer to the arbitrary asceticism or phony false modesty, but the acceptance of an inferior position, as Jesus did in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, where the same phrase is used. Children do not try to be humble, but they are so, and that's the same as the case for a really gracious person. And so, we know that one man was actually the greatest in the kingdom, Jesus Christ. This means that Jesus himself was humble like a little child. He wasn't concerned about his own status. He didn't have to be the center of attention. He could not deceive, and he didn't have an intimidating presence. Verse 5 through 6. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. So since the nature of Jesus is like one of these little children, how we treat those who are humble like children shows what we think of the nature of Jesus. It's actually, you know, easy to despise the humble. They're going to be the losers, the kind who will never make it out, uh, make it in our competitive and aggressive and get ahead world. Yet when we despise humble people, we are despising Jesus. And Jesus takes it seriously when one of his little ones is led into sin. Little ones does not only mean children, but those who humble themselves as children in the manner that Jesus described. And so it's a wicked thing to sin. It's far greater evil to lead others into sin. But leading one of Jesus' little ones into sin is far worse, because you then initiate someone into an instance or a pattern of sin that corrupts whatever innocence they had. And so a severe punishment is described here. It would be better for the offending one to receive this punishment of the millstone. Verse 7. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. 
So the first woe is a cry of pity for a world in danger of offenses. The second woe is a warning to the one who brings or introduces evil to others. So we live in a fallen world, and it's inevitable that sin and hurt and offenses come. Yet the person who brings the offense is guilty before God and has no excuse. And this teaches us that we can let go of the anger and bitterness for what people have done against us. God promised to deal with those by whom the offense comes. And if God promises to deal with those who offend his own, it shows that he defends and protects his own. This teaches us that in Jesus Christ, no other person can wreck our life. If they bring offense in our life, God will deal with them, but not forsake us in time or eternity. Verse 8 and 9. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It's better for you to enter into life lame or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It's better for you to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. So some people only keep from sin if it's easy or convenient to do it. Jesus warns us that we must be willing to sacrifice in fighting against sin, that nothing is worse than facing the wrath of a righteous God. And it really is better to sacrifice in the battle against sin now than to face the punishment of eternity later. And so there's significant problems in taking these words as literal instruction instead of just conveying an attitude. The problem is not only from the obvious physical harm that one might bring upon themselves, but more so in the problem that bodily mutilation does not go far enough in controlling sin. We need to be transformed from the inside out. And so if I cut off my right hand, I can still sin with my left. If my left eye is gouged out, my right eye can still sin, right? And if all the members are gone, I can still sin in my heart and mind. God calls us to a far more radical transformation than any sort of bodily mutilation can address. Verse 10, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So because God's mind and eye is always on his little ones, we do well to treat them with love and respect. And God protects the humble. And their angels is often taken as a reference to guardian angels. And we certainly do have angels watching over us and ministering to us, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, but there is no need to limit it to just one specific guardian angel. Verse 11 through 14, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine who did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And so the story is going to demonstrate value God places on individuals. God exhorts us to reflect that same care. And this parable is similar, yet it is different to the parable of the lost sheep in Luke 15, verse 3 through 7. <clears throat> and so here, Jesus is emphasizing the love and care we should have for all in the Christian community. The first temptation is to despise one, because only one. The next is to despise one, because that one is so little. The next, and perhaps the most dangerous form of temptation, is to despise one, because that one has gone astray. And so, <clears throat> the shepherd was happy when he found the sheep. He wasn't angry or bitter over his hard work or lost time. His joy was overflowing. And this shows us the character of God's love being like the care a shepherd gives for a lost sheep. It's individual love, patient, seeking, rejoicing love, protecting love. And so some will take this as an assurance that before the age of accountability, children are saved. But this is absolutely certain only of the children of believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, where it says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. For the rest, we must trust in God's mercy and the knowledge that the judge of all the earth will do right. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 25, where it says, Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. 
verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. So it's essential that we go to the offending brother first, not griping and gossiping to others, especially under the guise of sharing a prayer request or seeking counsel. Instead, speak to the party directly. And so it'd be wrong to, you know, take Jesus' word here as a command to confront your brother with every sin they commit against you. The Bible says we should bear with one another and be long-suffering towards each other. Yet clearly there are some things that we cannot suffer long with and we must address. And we can say that Jesus gives us two options when your brother sins against you. You can go to him directly and deal with it, or you can drop the matter under Christian long-suffering and bearing with one another. The other options, like holding on to bitterness, retaliation, and gossiping to others about the problem, is not allowed. So... If he hears you, you've gained your brother. You've gained him in two ways. First, the problem has been cleared up. Perhaps you realize that he's right in some ways, and he realized that you're right in some ways, but the problem is resolved. Second, you gained him because you have not wronged your brother by going to others with gossip and half the side of a dispute. Importantly, Jesus did not say that your brother must agree with you or immediately repent before you. At first, it's enough if he hears you. Verse 16 through 18. But if he will not hear, take one with you you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established and if he refuses to hear them tell it to the church but if he refuses even to hear the church let him be to you like the heathen and a tax collector assuredly i say to you whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven so the circle of people in a situation only becomes wider as the offended party uh, refuses to listen. So if the stubborn, unrepentant attitude remains, they are to be refused fellowship. And it's true that the one or two more, after hearing both sides of the story, may resolve that issue by assigning responsibility differently than the first offended person had thought. Right? For Proverbs 18 verse 17 says, The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. So the goal must be the restoration of relationship more than just proving some, you know, oneself right. And so the unrepentant one must be treated just as we should treat a heathen and a tax collector with great love, with the goal of bringing about full repentance and reconciliation. So if the matter cannot be resolved, then one is to be regarded like a heathen and a tax collector. The sense of being refused full standing and participation in the body of Christ is what Paul meant when he said to deliver such a one to Satan in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1-8. through 8. And there's a sense in which the unrepentant one is chastened by their being placed outside of the blessing and protection of fellowship. And so if this process is done humbly and according to the word, it is quite binding in the eyes of God, even if the unrepentant one just goes to another church. Verse 19 and 20. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So there is real power in agreement in prayer and in the presence of Jesus. This is exactly what the unrepentant ones miss out on. The ancient Greek agree is literally to, symp- uh, to symphonize. <clears throat> And so Jesus wants us to complement each other like a great orchestra, like a symphony. It's like a a metaphor taken from a number of musical instruments set to the same key and playing the same tune. And so we must take advantage of the power of agreement, which works on the principle related in Leviticus 26 verse 8, right, where it says, five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. And that's where five set a hundred enemies to flight, but a hundred set ten thousand enemies to flight. And that's difference between one defeating twenty and one defeating a hundred. There's real power, exponential power, in the prayer of agreement. Fascinating. Especially when we're talking about biblical matters here. And so Jesus here indicated that meetings of his people, indeed meetings full of power and authority connected to heaven, do not need to be large gatherings. They can be of two or three of his followers at a time. And so a meeting of two or three is easy to gather. Someone is always close at hand, and it isn't hard to find a place to meet. 
And so it's going to show us that large numbers are not essential. The rank of the people is not essential. The particular place is not essential. The particular time is not essential. And the particular form the meeting should take is not essential. Okay? And this is going to show us that the meeting in Jesus' name is the most essential. Gathering together in his name means that we are to be known by him and by his name. Gathering together in his name means that he is our point of gathering. We gather around Jesus. Gathering together in his name means gathering according to the character and nature of Jesus. And gathering together in his name means gathering in a manner that Jesus would endorse. This means that Jesus isn't up front, closer to the minister or the leaders. He's in the midst. He's there to be close to everybody. And it means that he should be proclaimed and revealed to all. Some people leave a church saying, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. And so, none but God could say the words. I'm there in the midst of them uh, to say them with truth, because God alone is everywhere present. And these words refer to his omnipresence. So let it be observed that Jesus is not among them to spy out their sins or to mark down their imperfections of their worship, but to enlighten, strengthen, comfort, and to save them. Verse 21 and 22. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times times seven. So what does all this mean? Peter, in light of what Jesus said about agreement and unity, hoped to sound extremely loving by suggesting forgiving a you know, a repentant brother up to seven times when three times was the accepted limit taught by many Jewish rabbis of that time. Usually we need a backdrop to understand all this, right? So Peter seven times is therefore generous compared to the rabbis, but Jesus' reply does away with all limits and calculations. It's up to 70 times 7. So Jesus answered unexpectedly, uh, saying that we are to forgive the repentant an unlimited number of times. Unlimited is the idea behind up to 70 times 7. Um, it would be strange if Jesus expected us to count offenses all the way up to 490. And at the 491st offense to deny forgiveness. And so <laughs> his allusion to Genesis chapter 4 verse 24 neatly contrasts Lamech's unlimited vindictiveness with the unlimited forgiveness of the disciple. Verse 23 and 24. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. So the king in this parable expected his servants to be faithful and honorable in the way they conducted his business. Therefore, one day he examined their work and would settle the accounts with them. And then uh, there's one who owed him 10,000. And so a lot of commentators out there will list the modern value of 10,000 talents as anywhere between 12 million and 1 billion you know, dollars. And <laughs> the figure clearly represents an unpayable debt. Verse 25 through 27. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I'll pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. So, of course, the man was not able to pay. Therefore, the master commanded to sell the debtor, his family, and everything that he had. And that would not satisfy the debt. Slaves at their top price were sold at a talent each, and usually for much less. Yet it would bring some measure of you know, justice. So, yeah, top price for a slave fetched about one talent, and one-tenth of that amount or less you know, was more common. And so the promise of the servant made no sense, right? Have patience, I'll pay you all. He spoke as if all he needed were just patience, that if he were just given enough time, he'd actually pay this massive debt. And the disciples listening to Jesus would think this was humorous. <laughs> and so the master showed mercy prompted by compassion, he forgave a debt that obviously could not be repaid, despite whatever promises the servant made. Verse 28 through 30. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Then he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay you all. And he would not. 
but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So the servant who was just forgiven an unpayable debt went out and found the one who owed him some money. And upon meeting him, he immediately assaulted him, took him by the throat, and demanded payment. And so the debt was real. 100 denarii was roughly equal to 100 days' wages. It's not an insignificant amount, but it was almost nothing compared to the debt that was forgiven by his master. It was actually one in 600,000 of the debt owed to the master by the first servant. And um, the debt was very, very small, but the claim was urged with intense ferocity here. And the man who owed the smaller debt used the exact same plea and promise that brought mercy to the man who had the greater debt. But it gained nothing, and the forgiven servant man put in you know put into a debtor's uh put that man into a debtor's prison verse 31 through 34 so when his fellow servants saw what he had done they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done then his master after he had called him said to him you wicked servant i forgave you all that debt because you begged me should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So there's no mention in the parable of the first servant's conscience bothering him about his conduct. It was his fellow servants that recognized the wrong that was done. And so when the master heard of this, he was understandably angry. And it's just wrong for a man who has been forgiven so much to then be so unforgiving. He then gave the first servant what he deserved, justice instead of mercy. Verse 35. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So the principle here is clear. God has forgiven such a great debt that any debt owed to us is absolutely insignificant in comparison. No man can possibly offend me to the extent that my sins have offended God. And this principle must be applied in the little things done to us, but also in the great things done to us as well. Because it still pales in comparison. So with this, Jesus taught an important and often neglected principle regarding forgiveness. There are many sincere Christians who withhold forgiveness from others for mistaken reasons, and they feel entirely justified in doing so. Their reasoning will work like this. We should not forgive another person who sins against us until they're properly repentant. And this is because repentance is mentioned in the context of our commands to forgive, such as in Luke chapter 17, verse 4, which says, And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times a day he returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Right, And because our forgiveness to others is to be modeled after God's forgiveness of us, since God does not forgive us apart from repentance, so we should not forgive others unless they properly repent to us. We even have the duty to withhold such forgiveness and to judge their repentance, because it's ultimately in their best interest to do so. This thinking, even if it means well, is incorrect and ultimately dangerous, because the parable shows us why it's incorrect for us to think. God doesn't forgive me without my repentance. Therefore, I must withhold forgiveness from others who sin against me until they properly repent. That thinking is wrong because I do not stand in the same place as God in the equation, and I never can. God stands as one who has never been forgiven and never needed forgiveness. I stand as one who has been forgiven and needs continual forgiveness. Therefore, if it were possible, we should be far quicker to forgive than God is, without precondition of a repentance, because we stand as forgiven sinners who must also forgive. We have an even greater obligation to forgive than God does. And since we have been forgiven so much, we have no right to withhold forgiveness from others. We are the debtor forgiven almost an infinite debt. Will we hold on to the small debts others owe to us? If anyone had the right to withhold forgiveness, it is God. And he forgives more freely and more completely than anyone we know. What possible right do we have to hold on to our unforgiveness? And it's also important to understand that a distinction can and should be made between forgiveness and reconciliation. True reconciliation of relationship can only happen when both parties are agreeable to it. And this may require repentance on one or both of the parties in the conflict. Yet forgiveness can be one-sided. 
Furthermore, forgiveness does not necessarily shield someone from the civil or practical consequences of their sin. For example, a homeowner may personally forgive the man who robbed his house, yet it's still appropriate for the robber to be arrested and put in jail. On a personal level, forgiveness is required. On a civil and societal level, the man who should be punished by the magistrates. Romans chapter 13. Nevertheless, the principle clearly stands. In context, this parable was given to make us more forgiving, not less forgiving. No one could reasonably read this parable and think that Jesus was trying to restrict the forgiveness of his disciples. People who read this, therefore, you know, be somewhat stingy with forgiveness as your Father in heaven is somewhat stingy with forgiveness, they're going to miss the whole point of the parable. Instead, Luke chapter 6, verse 36, Therefore be merciful, just as your Father is also merciful. And so this command from his heart is, is all the stronger. If we forgive in words only, but not from our hearts, we remain under the same condemnation. And it would be wrong to make this into the idea that unforgiveness itself is the unforgivable sin. It is better to say that forgiveness is evidence of truly being forgiven, and that habitual unforgiveness may show that a person's heart has never really been touched by the love of Jesus Christ. And so, those who will not forgive cannot expect to be forgiven. As James later will write, judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. James chapter 2 verse 13. Additionally, we remember the punishment of the unforgiving man in the parable of Jesus. The master delivered him to the torturers. There are many poor souls who are tortured by their own unforgiveness towards others.